If you have your Bibles today, and you'd be kind enough to join me in John chapter 6, John the 6th chapter, we're going to read a fairly lengthy portion today. John chapter 6, beginning at verse 48. And we're going to wind up reading about 22 verses through verse 68. But it'll read relatively quickly. I want to talk to us today. The Holy Ghost has laid on my heart a message. The albatross that is bad teaching. You wonder about that title? I'm saying simply, bad teaching is an albatross. It will drag you down. It will weigh you down. It will cost you. It will hurt you. Amen. That's what an albatross is. The albatross that is bad teaching. John chapter 6, beginning at verse 48 through verse 68, 47 through 68. I read as always from the King James text. Jesus is speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
Thou hast the words of the eternal life. Amen. The albatross that is bad teaching. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, lover of men's souls, comforter, king, redeemer, friend, we love you, Lord. We thank you for the presence of God. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, which allows us to come into the house of the Lord and not merely perform some religious exercise, but allows us to actually feel and sense and commune with you by your Spirit. You're in the house of God today. The promise of God being, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We know, Lord, you're here. I pray that you're in every living room, in every dorm room, in every motel room, every hotel room, every living room right now, God, where people are watching and listening to this message, either live or recorded. Let your anointing flow today like a mighty river touch this preacher. Help me to deliver the word you've placed in my spirit at this moment in time for the church of the living God and help it to find its mark in the heart of every hearer. Let us today have a heart and a mind that is cultivated by the Holy Ghost that it might be ready, able, willing to receive the engrafted Word of God. Let it become part of us. Let it not simply be words in our hearing, but Lord, let it do a work in us, even as it goes forth. Master, touch Save to the uttermost those that are lost. Reclaim the backslider. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. Deliver from demons. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. The Lord was teaching in this passage. And that which he had to say was too difficult for many people to hear. Oftentimes when we preach and teach the Word of God, folks, there is a challenge in what we're hearing. It is not always peanut butter fluff. It is not always marshmallow fluff. It is not always Oreos and milk. There are times when God serves up a steak and it requires that you chew on it a bit. Grow up and learn to chew. The Lord has more to say than just milk. And He wants us to digest it so that it might become a part of who we are in this passage the Lord was talking about the fact that he would be sacrificing himself offering himself as a sacrifice and that it was the offering of that flesh the pouring out of that blood that was going to be for the salvation of lost mankind and many heard him speaking in spiritual terms, but all they could hear it in was carnal terms. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are amazing. The preacher get up and preach something, and he's preaching a good, solid, sound, spiritual message. I remember growing up as a kid and going home from church and hearing my grandmother and others in my family griping and complaining about what the preacher preached because even though what he was preaching was good and sound and solid, they could only hear it through carnal ears. The Word of God declares in Romans chapter 8 
verses 6 through 8, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Many disciples were listening. You see, the Lord started out with far more than simply twelve disciples. There were twelve that he personally called. There were twelve that he personally addressed and asked if they would not leave behind the profession that they had known, be it tax collector, be it a physician, Luke, be it a, uh, a fisherman like Peter and follow him. And there were 12 men who were specifically called. That's why in the church, the ministry is comprised of people, it's supposed to be, who the Lord has personally called. The Lord knows who he can use. And he knows how he can use them. There are some people, you know, God is able to kind of mold them and make them into that vessel that he needs. He can make them into what he wants to use them to do. And there are many people who start out Listen carefully. With personalities and attributes that the Lord looks and says, you know something, if I'm going to call somebody to be a prophet, this is one guy I need to call to be a prophet. You know why? Because he's got stubborn faith. Hallelujah. This guy right here is so stubborn, he's going to believe God no matter what anybody or anything says. And if there's any I can use to talk to the church and tell them what they need to hear whether they want to hear it or not it's somebody like this do you follow what I'm saying and this is why different men and women are called by God to occupy various offices within the ministry he knows who he can use and he knows how he can use them but in the process of presenting a spiritual message that many, many listeners could not listen to and hear and understand and digest in spiritual terms, the Lord wound up with many of those who had long called themselves disciples walking away and saying, no, this, this, this is too hard for me. I'm going to tell you something. I've been in ministry over four, pastoral ministry for almost 40 years. I've had many people leave the church because something was too hard for them to hear. It wasn't like it condemned them. It wasn't like it, uh, you know, uh, was something that was malicious or mean. No, what the Lord was saying here wasn't condemning anybody. He wasn't criticizing anybody. But no, the spiritual uh, analogy that he was using was just not quite what people were willing to hear. I was talking to Stephanie in California and I said... <coughs> I've had people leave the church over the years because I would be teaching on biblical giving. And when I would talk about the fact that tithing was designed by God, according to the Word of God, to support the ministry, not the building, not the structure, not the infrastructure, not the uh, accoutrements of worship, not musical instruments, not pews. Not Sunday school wings. No. Tithing was designed by God as a way to provide for those 
men who served in ministry. He said the Levites, there were one tribe out of the 12 tribes who did not receive the language used in the King James's an inheritance. They did not receive a plot of land to make their own. Every other tribe received land out of the promised land. They were given different sections and different areas. The tribe of Dan has this area here. And this other tribe, Benjamin, has this area over here. And they were able to farm it and they were able to raise cattle on it. And they were able to do what they needed to do to support their families and eat and survive. But the ministry... The Levites had no inheritance. They were not given any area of the promised land to occupy and to farm and to live off of. Why? Because they were the ministers. Therefore, they would be dispersed throughout all of Israel. And if they are going to be dispersed throughout all of Israel, performing the work of the ministry, then how on earth are they going to be able to exist? How on earth are they going to be able to eat and live? They have no property. They have no inheritance. So God designed a system whereby his people were to give one-tenth of their fruit, one-tenth of their harvest, one-tenth of their flock. And it was literally one-tenth of everything. If they had an herb garden, they were expected to give one-tenth of the herbs they grew. One-tenth of every single thing they had that they grew in order to sustain themselves and to enjoy life. Included animals, included fruits and vegetables. It included spices and ointments and oil. Why? So that the priesthood, the ministry could have what they needed to live because they're doing what God has called them to do. Paul the Apostle said in the New Testament that God hath ordained that they which preach the gospel are to live of the gospel. So Paul said God has ordained that those who are in ministry are not to work secularly. A lot of people out there, well, I don't know why the preacher just can't work a job like everybody else, and all he does is preach on Sunday. Baloney, all he does is preach on Sunday. That just shows you how ignorant you are of the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is a 24-7 job, my friend. You try working a job during the week and getting a call at 3 o'clock in the morning that one of your members' husbands has been arrested for drunk driving and he's in jail downtown and the member of your church is in tears. She's hysterical and she needs you to go with her down to the prison and you've got to get up and go to work. You try getting a call at midnight one of your members has just been visited by the state police and their daughter was hurt, desperately hurt in an auto wreck and she's in a local hospital dying and the family is beside themselves and they need prayer, they need pastoral support, they're hoping for a miracle and you the pastor are getting out of bed at midnight so you can rush to the hospital to be there with that family. I've been in these situations. You try having to be there for a family when their daughter is going in for brain surgery. And they are beside themselves. They're worried, sick. 
because the surgery is going to take many, many hours and they are so afraid something could go wrong and the doctors have advised them that there are no guarantees that things occasionally go awry. And these people need the support, the love, the presence of their pastor. And a good pastor, I'm talking a good one, I know about the bad ones, but the good ones, they're not going to be there for 30 minutes and leave. No. Tommy, they're going to be there when the operation starts and they're not going to leave till the doctor comes out and says all is well. I took a trip down to Austin, Texas about a four or five hour car drive but I flew down and rented a car, stayed in a hotel room so that I could be there for one of our extended church members who was going in for a very, very lengthy and uh, complicated surgery. She asked me beforehand on the telephone, could you pray with me on the phone before I go in for my surgery? And I said, no. <laughs> and Cynthia said, why? You, you, you won't even pray with me on the phone? I said, why on the earth would I pray with you on the phone? I'm going to be standing next to you. I said, I'll be there. This lady's been part of our ministry for years. She and her husband, Scott, have loved us and loved our ministry for years. She's going through a very long and fearful surgery. I'm not going to sit at home and, you know, talk to her on the phone for 10 minutes before her surgery. No. Why in the world would I do that? I'm her pastor. Stephanie needed me. I went to California to be there for Stephanie and David. Folks, I'm telling you, you don't know what preachers do. You have no idea what ministry is about. God hath ordained that they which preach the gospel are to live with the gospel. But you know what? I've preached this and I've had people get mad and leave our church, haven't I? After I preached that. Because all they could hear it with was carnal ears. They couldn't hear it through spiritual ears. They couldn't understand the higher point and the more important lesson in what I was trying to say. Oh, I want to tell you, the Lord looks at the twelve, His twelve, those He personally called. And He said, are you twelve also going to leave me now? And Peter answers him, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. I'm going to tell you, where you get your teaching is important. Who you listen to, who you allow to fill your mind is important. Too many believers are careless about who they sit under. They're careless about what church they attend. Oh, this church has a great choir. This church has a great children's ministry. This church has a great music program. So I'm going to go to this church. Yes! And the teaching is foul! The teaching is inaccurate. There's no anointing. The power of God isn't there. Oh, but you have chosen to sit under that teacher for reasons that have nothing to do with the teaching. A lot of people go to a church, they've never even looked at the statement of faith. My Lord, am I telling the truth today? I know I am. Too many believers live their lives in a less than victorious manner. They do so because they have allowed themselves to be filled with bad teaching. Inaccurate teaching is probably the number one cause of most troubles for God's people. Did you hear what I just said? 
inaccurate teaching is probably the number one cause of most troubles for God's people as well as for the church of the living God in general. In Mark chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? They came to the Lord and said, We know that you are not moved by opinions of men. We know that you are not trying to, to appease the hearer. That is not your style. How many people go to churches and that is the exact style of their pastor? Oh, he takes surveys. He tries to get a feel for what the people like and what the people don't like and that's the direction he goes in. Because like so many uh, politicians today, they don't know how to lead they're not leaders, they're followers. I can only keep my pulpit. I can only keep my position. I can only keep my pastorate. I can only keep my income if I keep the people happy. I remember a pastor when I was a kid. We elected a new pastor, Brother Barlow. Our previous pastor was in the middle of a new building. We were in the middle of building a brand new building. And they had hired an architect and the architect had designed this beautiful, fancy looking building, boy. And our church had already bought the land. You know how a lot of times churches will buy a piece of land and for 10 years they got a sign on it that says future home of such and such. Well, we had that. We had a piece of land up on a hill that we had bought and it was there right next to our parsonage where the pastor lived. A home provided by the church for the pastor that leaked, that had a terrible heating system that was miserably uncomfortable, but every pastor we ever elected was willing to live in it. For those of you who think ministry, oh boy, they get free housing. Yeah, they sure do. You know what else they get? They don't get paid enough to buy their own home. I'm not kidding. Most pastors do not get paid enough to buy their own home. So therefore, while they're living in housing provided for them, they wind up with nothing for the future. When it comes time for them to retire, they're lucky if they were able to set money into a retirement fund. Otherwise, they're living on Social Security, have no home they bought, they have no equity, they have not, you know what I'm saying? Let me tell you, many, many pastors, many pastors today, are living that experience, especially depending upon the denomination that they're in. But there are those pastors who they are more concerned with what the people have to say and what the people think than they are what God has to say. They wouldn't dare preach what God puts in their heart because they know the church would run them out on a rail. And they'd lose their income. They'd lose their livelihood. I've been offered over the years pastorates of churches that already had congregations and already had buildings and all this. And I said, oh, no, thank you. Uh-uh, not interested. The only churches I'll ever pastor are churches I start. 
I want to make sure that that foundation is secure. I'm not going to take over somebody else's foundation. I'm not going to take over somebody else what they started building because I don't know what material they were using. I don't know how they built. My style may be very different. My standard may be very different. And I'm not about to try to build on another man's foundation. Listen to me now. And, and then find myself in a position where I'm beholden to the people. No, 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 no. Every ministry, every church that I've ever pastored, I started. That way I know from the ground up what's what. Hello now. And people who come into the church know from the ground up what's what. And they know when they come through the door that this preacher has a mind to preach what God gives him. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry for you, but that's <laughs> there's the door. They said to the Lord, they say, You don't you you don't care about men's opinions. You're not moved by men. In John chapter 8. Verses 31 through 36, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Ye shall know, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The most powerful weapon in the arsenal of God's people, listen to me, this is a statement that's going to rock some people. The most powerful weapon in the arsenal of God's people is not the name of the Lord. It is truth. Truth liberates. Truth sets free. Truth helps us to secure the blessing and favor of the Lord. Many believers throw the name of Jesus at troubles and issues that arise like it is some magic amulet. But unless we are using the name in conjunction with truth, our issues remain and our struggles persist. People and preachers can lay hands on us and pray until the stars fall from the sky. But as long as we are filled with wrong teaching, which in, ter in turn gives birth to wrong thinking and wrong conduct, we will not see the results we desire. Tommy had a co-worker some years back, pretty young lady. I liked her, I knew her, I liked her, she was sweet. She got involved with a church that was comprised primarily of folks from Africa. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to warn you right now, you want to get some foul doctrine, you want to get some wrong teaching, honey, get involved with somebody that comes out of the African continent. That continent has some of the worst, most polluted, diluted convoluted doctrine that you've ever, ever seen in your life. You better be careful. She got involved, I think, if I remember correctly, her ex-husband was Af African, and somehow or another he got her involved in this church. And all of a sudden, as time went by, 
And I say this with affection. That young lady lost her mind, didn't she? She lost her mind. She began to manifest more and more and more like she was losing her mind. I, she literally appeared to be someone who was going insane. It was that bad. And I would try to talk to her to try to help her. And she'd be spewing all this crapola that come out of this church. All this bad teaching. All this wrong teaching. All this foolishness. And you would try to help her. But by this point it was pretty much too late. As time passed she wound up leaving her job. And we lost touch with her. But the last we ever saw of her she was just completely wasted, ruined, bad teaching. It's an albatross, my friend. Bad teaching will ruin you. It will destroy you. It will bring you places you don't want to go. It will take you away from the blessing and favor of Almighty God. It will prevent you from receiving the deliverance you need. It will prevent you from receiving the uh, healing that you need. It will prevent the LGBT believer from walking in fellowship and in communion with the Holy Ghost. All because of bad And too many people are careless about who they choose to be their teachers. Throw in the name of Jesus and everything. Good Lord, I grew up in church. I'm going to be honest with you. That's the way we were taught. You know, it's like, oh, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Use the name of Jesus. And boy, I mean everything going on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And guess what? Half our prayers easily went unanswered. You know I'm telling the truth. Some of you people listening to me, you know good and bloody well I'm telling the truth. You've thrown the name of the Lord around like it's bird seed and you're <laughs> and you're somewhere in an arboretum got news for you honey the name of Jesus is powerful there's no doubt but it must be used in conjunction with truth you use the name of the Lord when you are addressing a situation and you know what the word of God says about that situation. When I cast out devils, I use the name of Jesus and it's powerful. Why? Because I know what the Word of God says. The authority that I have. I know what the Word of God says concerning the power that I have through that name. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But people are trying to use that name against devils who are not operating upon the authority of God's Word. Wind up themselves possessed. Wind up being attacked by the demoniac. Wind up in a mess. Why? Because they're not using it in conjunction with truth. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. I've got people I've known for years run around griping and groaning and moaning. Oh, I'm cursed. I'm this witch cursed me. This one cursed me. Somebody sent me a cursed object. And oh, for the last 15 or 20 years of my life, everything's just been chaos. Everything's just been terrible. And it's all because of this curse. My God! You are wearing false teaching, bad teaching around your neck like an albatross and it's bringing you down. It is costing you your victory. Don't you know what the Word of God says? And then when I remind them of this very passage, 
Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, all, all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any, any, any means hurt you. They look at me like I'm nuts. But if you're in a church that's preaching this to begin with, then you know better than to believe when trouble comes that God was not somewhere in the mix. Oh my Lord, listen to me now. See, true believers, believers who have been properly trained and properly taught, no, they ain't nothing come my way that God didn't have a hand in. Because nothing can come against me unless God permit it. And if God permitted it, then there is some divine purpose in it. And we know, Paul said, he didn't say we guess. He didn't say we think. He didn't say it's possible. He said, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. So when something less than positive comes our way, we look at it and say, okay, Lord, it may be the enemy's doing, but you've permitted it. Just like Job. Everything that come toward Job, everything that happened to Job, oh, it was the enemy doing it, but God permitted it. Am I telling the truth? I know the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. I know that the angels of God encamp around about them that fear him. I know what the word of God teaches. And by God, I'm going to believe the word of God, not my circumstance, not my situation. Hallelujah. If it's there, it's there for a reason. I know, for instance, the struggle of our ministry, the struggle we've been experiencing for so many years. I know it's not the byproduct of demons and devils so much as it is the byproduct of people's fear and unbelief. Many who learn of our ministry or who find us online allow themselves to fall victim to fear and unbelief. Now the enemy will most certainly try to foster fear and he'll try to foster unbelief in the hearts and minds of those who should be running toward the house of God. But listen to me, children. In the end, it is the responsibility of the individual. Just because the enemy... I've had people come to church and say to me, I was afraid the building was going to collapse on me. Had one girl come to church in Connecticut one time, and she said, I honestly, she said, I was fearful that if I walked into a church that the, that the building would collapse on me in judgment from God. But she came. Hallelujah. Oh, you're not going to get anywhere with God until you learn to act and until you learn to set your fear and your unbelief aside. We do it every day. Every time we do something that we're anxious about doing or we're fearful of, we're pushing past our fear to do that which we want or which we need to do. Flying in an airplane causes many people great anxiety, but they'll push past their fear because they want to go to Disneyland. Or they'll push past their fear because they want to go see their loved ones. Am I telling the truth? Why in the name of God do you think God's going to allow you to sit there and let your fear dictate to you? Staying away from the house of God and staying away from the church of God. Oh, after all, the devil has tried to make me fearful. That's all right. 
That's right. If you're going to get any work with God, you better learn to push past the fear. Come on now. You better learn to push past the unbelief. I went on a dolphin swim. I always wanted to swim with the dolphins. If I had my way, the best circumstance would be that I'd get in a kiddie pool and the dolphin would get in with me. I never have liked to be in water over my head. I, I have two cousins that drowned, and I never have liked to be in water that went over my head. Tommy and I were in Cozumel, Mexico. There was a place there where you could swim with the dolphins. I asked the man, I said, how deep is the water there when you're out there with the dolphins? How deep is that water? He said something like 30 feet or 20 feet, something like that. He said they have to be able to go pretty deep and swim up high, you know, and jump out of the water and all that. And uh, I thought, Lord, that's way deeper than anything I've ever allowed myself to be in. But you know what? The man promised me that my life fist would hold me up and let me float on the surface of the water. And I wanted to swim with dolphins bad enough that I went and got past my fear. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, children, I'm here to tell you, you got to get past your fear if you're ever going to receive anything from God. But you know it's funny if you'll step out, if you'll exercise a little bit of faith and get past that fear and do that with your fearful of, oh, you're going to find out the rewards are so much greater than your fear. Hello now. Oh, you're going to be so glad you did it. I was so glad that I swam with the dolphins. Hallelujah. People parachute who are terrified of heights. People go zip lining. Every day people get on amusement park rides so their heart can race and their adrenaline can be released. They're fearful, they're nervous, they're anxious, but they push past it because there's a reward beyond it that they're willing to push past it for. But when it comes to spiritual things, people want to let their fear dictate what they do and how they do it. In Revelation 21 and verse 8, I read it to you last week, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers. I'm going to tell you, God don't put the fearful and unbeliever in very good company. <laughs> and abominable and all murderer and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death Hebrews 11 and 6 but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him who we choose to submit ourselves to in the way of teaching is of the utmost importance. Who we choose to uh, who we choose as our mentors and teachers can make all the difference in our Christian experience and our journey with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 13, be not, uh, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I'll paraphrase. Bad teaching produces bad results, okay? Proverbs 5, verses 1 through 13. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. 
Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say how have i hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. The most dangerous place a believer can occupy is that place where we refuse to hear that which we need to hear. And we seek only to hear that which we want to hear. I know people like this, folks. Believe me, I kid you not. They have no interest whatsoever in hearing a single word that is something different than what they want to hear. I don't want to hear nothing. I want to hear what I need to hear is what I want to hear. Hello now. Amen. I go to church. I, I'm not going with any preconceived notion as to what the preacher ought to preach. All I know is I want him to preach what I need to hear. Hello now. Praise God. Don't you dare get up there and preach what I want you to say. Get up there and preach what I need you to say. Glory to God. I've said that these mega churches, they're so big and so grand. Why? Because preachers know how to fill them up and they're too afraid to tell the people they got what they got to do to make heaven their home. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Listen. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine. See, you didn't always preach in sweetness. You didn't always preach in roses and lilies. Sometimes you got to reprove. Sometimes you got to rebuke. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. In other words, people will elevate the teachers who are saying what tickles their ear, who is saying what they want to hear. You wonder why we got so many of these huge television ministries and these mega churches because men have learned what it takes. All I got to do is say what they want me to say. And that includes preaching against LGBT people. That includes preaching against abortion. That includes preaching this and preaching that. And preaching hard and sounding hard. Because that's what they think church is supposed to sound like. So as long as I give them what they think want to hear, I can go home with a seven-figure income. Hello now. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In 2 Peter 2 and 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There are times when truth bites. There are times when truth stings. But those but who of us has not endured temporary discomfort and painful procedures in the hopes of an eventual, an eventual healing and enduring health? 
More often than not, when I counsel with people over matters ranging from marriage and child rearing to spiritual warfare and demonic influence, the most common cause of the trouble at hand is bad teaching. Had the individual with whom I was speaking not been filled with erroneous teaching and wrong ideologies, we would not have been having that conversation at all. People come to me, oh, I've been cursed. I've been cursed. Believers say this. Oh, I've been cursed. I've been cursed. Proverbs 26 and 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. In Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Romans 8.31 What shall we say then uh, Then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 1 John 5.14 uh, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. My friend, failing to understand that truth is our most powerful tool is a major handicap. So much can be accomplished simply through one seeking out truth. Demons flee at the presence of truth. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. Salvation comes when truth is preached. Marriages are saved when truth is taught. Believers are emboldened and empowered by truth. The Holy Ghost baptism empowers us to be a witness and a testimony. But look at the first operation of the Holy Ghost in a believer's life. And I'm closing right now, John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. My Lord, have mercy. First operation of the Holy Ghost in our lives is to guide us not into truths, because you can have truths but not have the whole truth. But it's to guide us into all truth. Hallelujah. He'll guide you into all truth. Why? I'll tell you why. Because bad teaching, false teaching, wrong teaching, is an albatross. It'll cost you your salvation. It'll cost you your joy. It'll cost you your peace. It'll cost you, my friend, your victory. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. It'll cost you everything. You better be careful who you sit under. You better be careful who you submit yourself to and who you allow to fill your ears with teaching. Because the albatross that is bad teaching is destroying millions by the day. Praise the name of the Lord.